We gather to worship this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This time we're invited to kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you. For his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand as we join together in reading of the Psalm of the Day, which comes from Psalm chapter 123. To you I lift up my eyes, 
O you who are enthroned in the heavens, behold as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid servant to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us. For we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. We join together in singing hymn number 692. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, your almighty power is made known chiefly in showing mercy. Grant us the fullness of your grace, that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture reading. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of Ezekiel 2, 1 through 5, and in your pew Bible, 693. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels, who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants also are impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading comes from 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10, and can be found in your pew Bible in 970. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. 
whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except except of my weaknesses. Though if I should but wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing of greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, When you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we join together in singing hymn number 839.
invite you to open a Bible to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, our gospel reading this morning as we continue to look at the life and ministry of Jesus and as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear and receive God's word this morning, we go to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that they would be made still by the Holy Spirit and comforted by the gospel this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit would enliven and uplift them in their faith through the hearing of the gospel. And Father, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the gospel of Jesus Christ for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my Redeemer and my Rock. Amen. So this is an interesting story in the Gospel of Mark. So far, Jesus has begun his ministry. He's begun teaching. He's healing people. He's preaching in synagogues. And so far, everybody loves him. He's collected some disciples and followers, and people are amazed and astonished at his work and his ministry. And then he goes to his home after doing many miracles and powerful things that have gathered crowds and amazed people and left them wondering who he is and all kinds of wonderful things that he's done, right? He's calmed the storm, right? He's healed people. He's cast out demons. All these things that we look at Jesus and wonder and amaze at him and go, that's our Savior, right? That's our Lord. That's our God who does these miracles miracles for his people. All that has happened, and he's gathered a crowd, and they're following him, and he goes back home, and he's rejected, which is kind of surprising, because if you've been reading the story, you think, well, if he's going to go back home, he's going to go to his own people, and they're going to be like, wow, we've got a hometown superhero. We've got a guy from our own home that does miracles and is a prophet, an amazing teacher, and yet... These people that are supposed to know Jesus the best are the ones who reject him. And we're going to talk about that today of why they rejected him, how they rejected him, and then, unfortunately, how you and I do the same thing in our own lives, right? So we're going to start with Ezekiel chapter 2. This prophet uh, Ezekiel is called by God to preach to people. And one of the things that I notice when people look at the Bible, they think that people in the Bible times had their act together, right? Which is far from the truth because if you read the Bible, the reason it's there, the reason the prophets are there is because people didn't have their act together at all. In fact, it was the exact opposite. There were people that were supposed to know God the best, worship God the most faithfully out of the whole world, were often the people that would reject God, rebel against his commands and his ways in their lives, and go their own way. And so Ezekiel is one of these prophets who is called by God, and he's given this command to go and preach. In verse 5, it says, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So God sends Ezekiel, like many prophets, to the people of God, the people of Israel, and he says, I want you to tell them, thus says the Lord, this is what God says, here's his word, here's how you are to repent. And if you've read your Bible, you're familiar with it, you'll know that they don't listen, right? They, they often reject the prophets. Jesus tells parables about this, and he says, you're just like your forefathers who rejected the prophets. And so here's the bad way to read the Bible. The bad way to read the Bible, as Luther would say, is to look at the people of God in the scriptures and go, I would never behave like that, all right? If God came to me in his word like he did with Ezekiel, I would just listen. So how many of you, when you hear the word of God, you listen? Every time. All right? That's the whole point of confession and absolution is the fact that we have to confess that we don't listen, right? And that's why our confession covers everything. It covers things that I've done wrong and things that are good that I left undone, right? So even if you're like, well, I didn't do that many bad things, You know, there's a lot of commands in the Bible. God says, don't do these things, right? But there's also a lot of commands in the Bible where God says, here's what I want you to do. And here's our guilt in this. Just like the people of God way back in Ezekiel's day is that we hear the word of God and we go, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. I don't feel like doing that today, right? 
So it might be God says, I don't want you to live this way. I don't want you to behave that way. I don't want you to think or speak this way. And we go, but I really want to because it feels good or it feels comfortable or it feels right. Or maybe God is saying, here's what I want you to do for your neighbor. And you're thinking, I don't like my neighbor. No one thinks that, right? You're all just sweet little angels. But sometimes God wants you to love people and you don't want to love them, right? Right? Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount says, I want you to love your enemies and pray for them. So how many of you pray? Show of hands, you pray regularly, all right? How many people you pray for your loved ones, all right? Now, how many people in the room pray regularly like Jesus told us to for the people that really angered you this past week or really hurt you? And like, you didn't pray good things, you prayed, please, Lord, smite them, all right? That's not really what Jesus is getting at, but sometimes we're tempted to, right? And you're like, I pray, right? Jesus is like, no, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to forgive them, and I want you to pray for them. So here's the deal. We are not that different from the ancient people of God, right? He sends Ezekiel, he sends the prophets, and he tells Ezekiel, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand before them and say, thus says the Lord. Here's the word of God. We have the word of God just like they did, and yet, just like they did, he goes, but they're rebellious people. Sometimes they're going to hear and listen, and sometimes they're not. So before we get all judgy, judge about the people of Israel and the people of Nazareth rejecting Jesus, we have to come before the word of God humbly and go, are there parts of God's word where I reject it because I don't like it? I hear what the word of God says. I hear what it tells me not to do. I hear what it tells me to do. And yet I still refuse to listen and obey. Instead, I go my own way. Right? Right? In our liturgy, we sing, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, right? You know what that statement comes from? It comes from the Gospel of John where Jesus does a miracle and then he gives a sermon. Everybody loves the miracle, but nobody liked the sermon and thousands of people walked away from Jesus that day. So he looked at his disciples. He said, are you going to walk away too? And Peter's response was, where else am I going to go? You're the one with eternal life. See, that's the point of the word of God. Jesus also in the gospel of John says that we get the word of God when we get him and we get eternal life when we get him. And so we don't just go to the word of God to go, am I following the rules? We go to the word of God to understand, am I getting Jesus right in my life? And I know we're Christians, we're in church, we know the right answer is, of course I love Jesus, but I want us to humbly approach the word of God today and go, are there areas in my life where I hear the word of God, I hear the word of Jesus, and I go, I don't like it, I don't want to do it, and we reject him. Are there parts of God's word that convicts you of sin that you need to repent of and kill and get rid of, and you go, but I really like doing it, so I'm going to reject Jesus. So when we understand that what the people of God were rejecting is not just a miracle work or a prophet, they're rejecting the very word of God, we can see that we do the same thing in our own lives, right? Because it's really easy to look at the story of Mark chapter 6 and go, I would have been there with the disciples. I would have been the faithful one. But here's the deal. You and I have the word of God. We have the words of Jesus. And the question becomes, Am I one of the faithful ones, or am I one of the ones that rejects him in my daily life? So let's look at the story, Mark chapter 6. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? So what are they doing? They're kind of asking rhetorical questions of praise, right? They know what Jesus has been up to for the first five chapters of Mark. They know about his teaching. They know about his ministry. They know about his miracles. They know about the signs and wonders that he's done that have left everybody astonished. They know about the healing of the demons and the casting out of demons. They know all this stuff, and they look at Jesus, and they still struggle with believing him and being faithful to him. That should be amazing to us. 
Because a lot of times I hear people, well, if I could just see Jesus do something in my life, if I could just see a miracle, if I could just see some sign or wonder from God in my life, then I would know for certain, and then I would follow him more closely. I would love him. I would obey him more closely. Right? We, we have this temptation sometimes of like, well, it was easy for the disciples. I mean, they were there when he rose from the dead. How many of you would like to have been there? And that would be really cool to walk around with Jesus after he rose from the dead. I think that would be a neat thing to do. Yet in the Gospels, Jesus tells a parable of a man who dies rejecting the word of God and is suffering and torment from it. And he asks another man, he asks Father Abraham to go and tell his brothers about this torment so that they will be warned and repent of their evil ways. And at the end of the parable, Jesus says, even if someone should rise from the dead, they won't believe if they've rejected the word of God. You see, the point of the problem here, the crux of the issue for the people here is not that Jesus didn't do the miracles, that he didn't do the signs and wonders, that he didn't heal people, that he didn't cast out the demons. The thing that they're rejecting is his teaching. They're rejecting the word of God. And they're astounded by it, even though they're amazed by it, they have all this evidence in front of them. They look at Jesus, they hear his word, and they say, I don't believe it. Right, so the issue of faith doesn't come down to, did God do a miracle? Right, that's often part of this story. Is, well, Jesus didn't do enough miracles, that's why they believe. They knew about the miracles. They knew about chapters one through five. They had heard about it all. Many of them had seen it. They knew about it, and yet... They're rejecting Jesus. The issue of faith is not, does God do the miracle or not? It's, do I believe and trust in his word? Right? Martin Luther described faith in the book of Concord as, I would trust in the promises of God's word a thousand times over. I would trust my whole life to his promises. So the issue for the people of Nazareth is, even though they had all this evidence in front of them, they had Jesus himself doing all these miracles. When they hear the word of God, they hear his teaching, they reject it. They don't trust in the word of God. They don't trust in his preaching and teaching. So the same issue is for you and I. It's not about, well, what if Jesus did a miracle or didn't do a miracle? The issue for you and I is, do I trust the word of God? Do I trust the teachings in the word of Jesus, and do I trust and obey what he has given to me through the Bible? And so here's what happens next. Verse 3, they look at Jesus and they ask, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So what they do is they look at Jesus and they're basically like, We know who you are. You're the carpenter's son. You're a carpenter. You're a construction worker. We know who you are. How can you claim to be this amazing prophet? How can you claim to be this amazing miracle worker when we know who you are? Well, the issue is they didn't really know who Jesus was, right? They saw his human side, but they didn't see his divine side. They didn't understand that it was God working through Jesus to do all these wonderful things, and that it was God in the flesh coming to bring the word of God to them. So here's another hard question of repentance for us is, do I really know who Jesus is? Am I basing my faith on the words of Jesus, on the words of God, or am I basing my faith just on what I've heard about him or what I think about him? Right, who's the authority of your faith? Is it you or is it Jesus? Later on in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is going to gather his disciples again and ask them the question, who do people say that I am? And, right, and they give all kinds of wonderful answers, right? A prophet from old, a miracle worker, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, all these answers. And then he asks them the question, but who do you say that I am? Which is actually the point of the story. See, Jesus doesn't care about what do the crowds say about me? What do the people of Nazareth think about me? He wants to know what do my followers, what do my disciples think about me? Who do they, who do you say that he is? And it's very tempting in our day and age to go, well, he's a nice teacher. He's a prophet of God. He did some miracles. He had some great ethical teachings. But if you look at who Jesus is and what he does and what he says in his word, 
you'll arrive at a very different answer. In fact, the whole point of the Gospel of Mark is to show you from the very beginning chapter to the very end chapter that Jesus is the Son of God who has come to redeem us. But you only get that if you listen to him. You only get that if you listen to the word of God. You don't get that if you just listen to yourself or listen to the culture of the world. See, the people of Nazareth had heard about Jesus. They had heard about the things he did. He had heard about the miracles. Yet when he was standing in their presence, they rejected him because they didn't get to know him for themselves. And so the question for you and I is, how do I learn about Jesus? Who is Jesus to me? And the answer needs to be based on what God's word says, what Jesus says about himself. And so he goes on, he responds, and Jesus says, so a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. It's one of the few times that Jesus marvels at something in the Gospels. Sometimes he marvels at people's belief because they were Gentiles and they believed in him. They were outsiders that believed in him when his own people were rejecting him. But this is a case where his people, his own people, the people that should believe in him the most, reject him and he marvels at it. Isn't that kind of profound to think about that Jesus marveled at something? Something kind of surprised him, got his attention, and it was their lack of belief in who he is. So here's a third repentance question for us to consider as we look at this story, is do I believe Jesus is who he says he is? He says he is the God who can do the impossible. Do I believe that? Right, throughout the Gospels, he says, all things are possible with God and nothing is impossible with God. Right, all these wonderful promises. But do I believe that? Right? That's what faith comes down to. Do I believe in Jesus as he has revealed himself in his word? Do I believe in Jesus who says that he is the God who can do anything? If I believe that about Jesus, it changes everything about my faith and the way that I follow him. Everything in your life, in your faith, comes down to your answer to the question, of, do I believe Jesus as he's revealed himself in his word? Because if I believe Jesus is just a nice teacher, I will go to him for advice and help, but nothing else, right? This is why you go, anybody go to your friends for advice and help sometimes, or family members, right? You go, well, that was great advice, but we can treat Jesus like that. If we just view him as a miracle worker and nothing else, when we don't get the miracle, we will walk away disappointed, right? But if I believe in Jesus as he reveals himself in his word, it changes everything because he becomes the God who forgives and redeems. He becomes the God who can do what I think is impossible, And if I believe he is the God who forgives and redeems me, when I am overwhelmed with sin and guilt and shame, I will run to him for love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness, right? Rather than running away from him as an angry judge. If I believe he's the God that can do anything, it will affect your prayer life. The most important thing you can do to impact your prayer life is believe in Jesus as he says he is. Because if I believe he's the God that can do anything, guess what I can pray about? Everything, anything. There's nothing too big or small that he can't handle. If I believe that Jesus is the one who gives and sustains life, then I will turn to him for all my needs in life, and it will begin to ease my worry and my fears about the future. See, this story is a story about getting Jesus right. And if you and I get Jesus right, it changes everything about our lives and our faith. Because oftentimes what the devil wants us to do is we want, he wants us to get Jesus wrong so we limit our faith, right? Here's an example. Jesus can do anything, so let's pray about everything, right? Do we agree on that today? The devil comes along and goes, well, you prayed about it and nothing happened yet, so must be time to move on. 
But if I believe in Jesus as he has revealed himself to me in his word, I will be stubborn in my prayer. I will be stubborn in my faith and say, no, God can do it. Jesus can do it. He can do the miracle. He can do what I think is impossible. And sometimes he will and sometimes he won't. But what he's revealed to me in his word is that he's the one who can. And he's the only one who can. Now, there's one little detail at the end of verse 6 that is really important to understanding who Jesus is. It says, he went amongst the villages teaching. All right, it's just this little detail. You think, okay, that's a transition sentence. We're moving on to the next part where he commissions the disciples. But I want to pause here and end here with this little detail. Jesus went on into the other villages preaching and teaching. He went on preaching and teaching the kingdom. We know that because the rest of the gospel. But here's the point. Jesus meant resistance. There was this rebellious group of people. There was these sinners who rejected him. And you know what his response was to sinners who rejected him? He was to keep on going, to keep on preaching, and to keep on teaching. Jesus was stubborn in his love for sinners. He didn't give up on the people that rejected him. And that is such good news for you and me. Because as much as we repent, As much as we confess, as much as we turn away from sin and turn towards Jesus, I know about myself, which is probably true for all of you, is that I need to repent every day. I make mistakes every day. I'm an imperfect person every day. And so there are days and hours and moments every week where I reject Jesus, but the good news is he doesn't reject me, and he doesn't reject you. He had this whole village look at him and go, get out of here, you're crazy. We don't believe in you. We don't trust in you. And his response was, well, I'm gonna keep on preaching the gospel and teaching about the kingdom of God and God's love for sinners. So here's the point of getting to know who the real Jesus is. He is a savior who stubbornly loves sinners, you and me. The end of Psalm 23 says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And that promise becomes true in Jesus. He's going to hunt you down. He's going to chase you down with his grace and mercy every day of your life. He's not going to give up on you. And how do I know this truth? Because the word of God tells me in 2 Timothy, he says, when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. So when we are unfaithful, when we have doubts, when we reject Jesus, whatever manner that rises in our lives, his response is to remain faithful in his love towards you and me. Jesus loves you with a stubborn love. And that is so good. And that's why we want to worship him and praise him. Because the Jesus that's revealed to us in his word is one who loves sinners and never gives up on us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. That even though we are rebellious people who reject you in our sin, you stubbornly love and forgive us. You never give up on us or abandon us. Instead, each and every day, you pursue us with your love, forgiving us and giving to us grace and mercy. May we trust in who you are as you revealed yourself in your word, and may we faithfully proclaim that word to the world around us. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We go to our God in prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We bless you, O Lord, for you have heard the voice of our pleas for mercy and sent your Son, Jesus Christ, our strength and shield. Save your people and bless your heritage forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Gracious Lord, you have revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations. Christ Jesus, your holy arm. By his death and resurrection, you have worked salvation. Strengthen the song of your church. Give skill to musicians, poets, and artists. Give boldness to your congregation in this and every place to sing the eternally new song of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, protect and defend our nation from its enemies. Support our leaders and preserve them from temptation. Through the work of all civil authorities, enable us to live a quiet and peaceful life according to your word. Lord, in your mercy. Father, in our weakness, we are strong for the sake of Christ, whose grace is sufficient in every need. Give comfort to those whose pain is chronic, whose suffering is unknown, who wrestle with difficult thorns in the body or mind, who are tempted to despair. In weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, let us boast in Christ and his cross, by which we in our sufferings are sanctified. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, O Holy Father, for the sake of Jesus who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship with our tithes and offerings. I invite you to stand as we give thanks to God for all his gifts to us by joining together and singing hymn number 805.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup was the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
invite you to stand for the communion blessing. This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve in your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing, thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you refresh us to this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A one important announcement for our congregation. So next week, we will be having a... Um, voters meeting to discuss the bids that were received for our construction project. So part of the process has been going to bidding and permitting. We finally received the bids back, um, and we had a quick meeting following the bids as a construction committee, and then we went to leadership team, and we also went to the endowment committee. Um, the result of the bidding is that the total estimate for uh, the highest possible cost that they told us with the bidding would be $2.3 million, which is significantly above um, the original estimates that we had been given. And so we have made a recommendation, the construction committee, endowment committee, and leadership team all together have made a recommendation to the congregation to request $2.3 million out of the endowment fund to pay for the project. Um, we will be sending out more detailed information um, coming this week, but we'll have to have a meeting, um, voters meeting next week as a congregation to pray about that and make a decision about the construction project regarding the bidding that came back. Um, the reason we're having it so soon is because the bids are only good for 30 days. Otherwise, they expire, and then you have to spend a lot of money to get new bids, and it takes a lot more time. So we're trying to be good stewards of the time, not just the money, but the time that we have as a congregation. So we need to meet uh, next Sunday after service to pray about that and to discuss that and vote on that as a congregation um, to see how God will lead us in the construction project going forward. So we want to let you know as soon as possible about that. So please... If you are able to join us for the voters meeting next week, please do so. We'll also be emailing out more information um, this week with more details about the proposal to the congregation. So if you're nervous or worried about that or you have concerns about that, remember the book of James, God says that if anybody lacks wisdom, pray to him and ask him for it and he will give it to you. And so what we want to do as a congregation is trust in the provision and the gifts of God that he has given to us as a congregation. Also ask him for wisdom on the best way to go forward. So with that, receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.